Welcome to this midweek program. Um, I'm always happy when I encourage people to start things from seed. Um, I know when I go in a lot of places that sell plants, I see the same old thing all the time. Um, so if you want to grow a much wider range of things, then uh, get busy starting things from seed. Um, some things will germinate almost right away without any special care. Um, but there's also quite a few things that um, need special treatments in order to germinate. And at this time of the year, in the fall and early winter, when um, things are ripening, um, a lot of the things that ripen this time of year need a, a, a chilling over winter in order to germinate. Now, why would plants have such a thing? Well, think about it. If, if you're a seed and you're a mature seed and you have, uh, you're capable of germinating and you germinated now in um, the second day of winter, well, as a tiny little seedling, you may, might not survive uh, the coldest parts of winter. So plants have evolved a number of different mechanisms to prevent them from germ germinating um, prematurely. Um, a lot of things have hard seed coats. Um, some things have chemical inhibitors, either in the seed or in the flesh around the seed, in the fruit. Um, and some have um, embryos that aren't yet mature. So even though the fruit, the seed might look mature, the embryo itself is not yet capable of germinating. Um, and in the, in the course of this uh, presentation, when I use the word fruit, I'm using it in the botanical sense. The fruit is the part of the plant that has the seed. Um, it is not necessarily edible. And one thing I do want to um, emphasize is that um, many seeds and fruits are poisonous. And even though, um, uh, you know, these various legumes are in the same family as pinto beans and soybeans and green beans, um, there are many very poisonous members of that family. And um, if you think of the um, umble family, the family um, of carrots and parsley and cilantro and um, so many other edible plants. There's also some of the most deadly plants. So I will use the term fruit just in a botanical sense, but I also want to make the point that just because you know that certain members of a genus or family are edible doesn't mean that all of them are. So don't be putting things in your mouth unless you're positive you know um, what it is and whether or not it is indeed edible. Um, some things with hard seed coats, um, you know, just the effect of freezing over the winter will soften that seed coat. They'll develop a few cracks and then they'll be able to um, take in water or imbibe water is the uh, technical term. Um, and, uh, you know, one way of getting a, around that um, hard seed coat is to actually scarify this seed coat, to do something to actually damage the seed coat. And it could be physically nicking the seed, um, either, you know, individually with a knife or maybe between a couple blocks of sandpaper. Or, um, you know, the hard seed coat could be um, slightly destroyed using uh, sulfuric acid. I, I'm actually, this is um, honey locust um, seed pods, honey, honey locust fruit. And I'm not, I don't think there's any seed in here, but this is um, one of our native uh, legumes. This is um, um, Senna marilandica. Um, gee, what is its common name? Um, and the, the legume family is, you know, characterized by having these bean pods and these seeds are fairly small and there's quite a few in each one. And one of the distinguishing features of Senna marilandica, the Mar Maryland 
bush pea, maybe it's called. Um, Missouri Botanic Garden calls it wild senna. Wild senna, um, which isn't a terribly helpful common name since it's Senna Marylandica, referring to the, you know, the state of Maryland, though it's much more wider spread than that. So these have these small seeds, they're a little bit, well, they're about the same size as a black lentil. Um, and we could sow them now, and they will probably germinate um, in the spring after being outside for the winter. Um, and you can often blow away the chaff, or we could also nick the seed coats. But um, that's sort of slightly off topic, but I, I will mention it. Um, red buds are another legume, another member of the legume or bean or pea family. And this is the little, um, one of the Chinese um, red buds. And the, these seeds were collected late summer and the seeds were um, treated with sulfuric acid. Those who have a lot of experience treating seeds with sulfuric acid know how long a particular species needs to be treated. Um, and I don't remember how long these were treated, but um, one year, Dr. Denny Werner, the red bud breeder, treated a number of different seeds uh, for the Arboretum with um, sulfuric acid. And one of them was a Chinese um, silver bell, um, Halesia um, McGregori, I believe. And he treated that, he, he had them soaking in um, sulfuric acid for like eight hours because they have such a thick woody coat. But you have to know those things. So uh, something with a hard seed coat can be either sown this time of year and just let winter, um, you know, open the seed coat, or they can be physically scarified or chemically scarified. But if you do scarify the seed, then you actually probably don't want to leave them outside because they will germinate very promptly. In that case, you could just hold on to the seed and do it in late winter when you can sow it and put it outside, or late winter, early spring, and just put it outside once you sow it. Um, when, when seeds with hard seed coats are, um, um, the term is vernalized, put out for the winter chilling, um, the rate of um, the softening of the seed coat will vary. So when they germinate, they will tend to germinate over a long period of time because the seed coat won't degrade at the same rate for each seed. Um, whereas when you physically scarify, they, they germinate over a much shorter period of time because all, the, all of them have had their seed coat uh, damaged. And if you, um, if you scarify them with a knife, you don't, you know, you don't want to cut much of the actual inside of the seed away, you really just need the, and you're not going to be able to see this um, on the camera. And these are, let me put on my reading glasses. Over the years of doing this, I, I haven't lost any fingers. I still have six fingers per hand, um, which is more than enough. Um, these seeds are very slick. I was thinking the honey locust would have um, seed that I could demonstrate on because their its seeds are much bigger. But if you can st stabilize, you really just need the slightest little nick through the seed coat. You know. The seed coat on this center is black and you can see I've cut through the seed coat and you can see the white endosperm inside and that's more than enough opening in the seed coat um, for water to entry and then they'll, they'll swell. If you soaked them in water, they'd be all swollen up by the morning. But, uh, you know, we're talking about sowing seeds this time of year that need winter chilling. So, um, you could just sow them and leave them outside for the winter, which would be fine. Now, there are a lot of things, members of the aster family, 
Um, this is an aster, an Asian aster. And this is also a member of the aster family. The aster family is that huge family that used to be known as the composite family. Um, and you, you're thinking, well, that looks a lot like a dandelion. Well, the dandelion's in the aster family. And um, calling it the aster family is a little bit confusing, but a lot of the plant family names come from the first genus named in that family. Um, so, uh, and it, of course you remember from high school biology, family genus species. Um, so the aster is just one genus in that very large family, but many of them do have the little winged, the little parachutes on the seed um, because they're, they're dispersed by, um, um, by wind and the little pappas, the little parachute on the seeds carry them away. Um, Alexander, can you, I, is it show up better on the cardboard? On the card. Yeah. Um, let me get this other trash out of the way. Um, you can see, I'm going to put my knife blade about the middle of these. Um, you see the, the seed is this dark slender part at the end and then you have the little pappas, the little parachute at the other end. Um, I guess somebody who was very particular could pluck the seed off the pappas and sow that, but I've never known there to be any harm to in sowing the whole thing. Um, you know, here's here's much much of the seeds from one one flower head. And technically, th the seed is actually a fruit. When you think of a sunflower seed, the seed is the part inside, but the whole thing is the fruit with the, you know, the dry outer part of the fruit around the seed. Um, Doug, I think one little thing I remember for sowing seeds that had a little fluffy thing on them is you yeah. could just uh, take a match to them. And poof. All the little fuzzy parts go off. Do you so have matches on you? I don't have matches on me. I'm oh, sorry. but I'm a pyromaniac. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if you want to get rid of them, I think that's a nice, quick, and easy way of doing it. Well, that that's cool. Um, I always love learning things when I'm, um, you know, the one instructing. So thank you. Um, now th this this is the aster I showed you a minute ago, and it too has the little parachutes on them, and you see it's the same kind of structure. Um, but, um, and they're going to blow away, but I think you can see, yeah, these tiny little seeds, you know, s sometimes I sow things and I'm not sure exactly what it is that I'm sowing, but often something comes up anyway. And you see how readily the little parachutes carry the seeds away. Um, so, um, and our what, uh, grasses, a lot of our native grasses and other ornamental grasses ripen this time of year. And this is a uh, switchgrass, panicum, uh, specifically panicum virgatum. And it will hold its seed um, most of the winter and in late winter. Um, if you're real quiet and it's a warm sunny day, you'll sometimes hear these little popping noises because uh, the seeds will be expelled explosively. But at this point, you can just sort of almost rake them off the um, inflorescence and end up with a handful of seeds. Can you s see this well enough? Yep. Yeah. And again, these aren't exactly clean seeds, but they don't really need to be cleaned any further than that. Um, and they would be ready for sowing. Um, and this is an interesting example. This is Amsonia blue star, native uh, herbaceous perennial. And they have these long slender pods. And when you open them up, um, this, when you open them up, it's a long stack of seeds inside. This 
See, the, the seeds are pretty large. Each one of these is a seed. Um, and the seeds are, we know are quite viable because we get lots of seedlings from it in the garden. But those are ready to sow. Um, and the na native hibiscus, um, this one thankfully is still full of seed. Um, it's actually fairly late in the year to um, collect seed because a lot of things have already been shed, but you can still find things. Of course, may maybe you're not collecting seed at all, but you're uh, either buying them from a commercial source or you b belong to one of the plant societies that has seed exchanges. The American Rock Gardens Society just sent out their seed list, which is, I don't know, a thousand different things on the seed list or so, maybe, maybe twice that number, I don't know. But many other plant societies like the uh, Species Irish Society, the Hardy Plant Society, uh, the Alpine Garden Society. There's so many plant societies that you can belong to that have um, seed lists. And so many of the things that end up on those seed lists are things you um, probably couldn't acquire readily otherwise unless you grew it yourself from seed. So, um, you know, getting over your fear of starting things from seed is a, a good day because then, you know, there's so many wonderful things you could grow. Um, and many of the things that um, are ready to harvest and sow this time of year have fleshy fruit. Um, one of our many native hollies, this is Yopan holly, Ilex vomitoria. Um, and uh, um, the Japanese, what do they call it, sacred lily? Rhodia japonica. Uh, th these actually will uh, remain in good shape all winter long. So, um, you know, whether you harvest them today or whether you harvest them in March, though, you can still find them out in the garden. And this is asparagus. Um, we grow a number of different asparagus as ornamental plants, and this is um, asparagus acutif acutifolia. Um, acute isn't referring to cute, but rather acute, like sharp, like an acute angle. And I, I, some things that are, this is acute folia, maybe because the foliage is kind of sharp or prickly. And many uh, um, asparagus are red when they're ripened, but this species, um, the fruit is green, and then when it's fully ripe, they turn black. Now, some of them are turning brown, and I think that's probably from the uh, freezing overnight, but the seed will still be good. Now, um, in most cases, things uh, with fleshy fruit need to be cleaned. And, um, you know, some things, these bigger things are easy enough just to clean by hand. The um, um, rhodia, these aren't Terribly, these are not big fruit on this one, maybe because it's so early in the year, but you, often the fruit are about twice this size. And, um, you know, sometimes when they're, they're bigger, there might be more than one seed um, per fruit, but you see these two have just had one seed per fruit. And, you know, this topic of growing things from seeds, there are a lot of generalizations and then a million exceptions. I tend to think that things that are f seeds that are produced in fleshy fruit tend not to want to be dried out real thoroughly. So it's better to clean them and sow them fairly promptly. I don't mean immediately, but fairly promptly. Um, there are a number of woody plants that have um, mature seeds in the fall that need to be sown right away. The buckeyes and white oaks, not, not red oaks, but the white oak group, um, they really need to be sown, you know, within a week or so of collecting, the sooner the better, because you, you can see that they start to shrivel if, if you don't sow them and then you're starting to lose viability. 
Um, and the Hollies are an example where um, there's probably a hard seed coat on the seed inside, but the embryo in the holly, I'm not sure these are even mature. They're, they're still sort of soft. And I would have expect these yellow seeds, I would have expected to be brown, but the embryo in hollies is not mature at the time that the fruit is ripe. So the, the embryo itself has to mature um, after the seed is sown. And I'm sure it, the embryo is living off whatever food is stored within the seed. Um, and some things, I don't specifically remember if, if it's true of hollies, but some of the things that need chilling actually need more than one winter's worth of chilling. Um, you know, some lilies have incredibly complicated germination requirements. And let me also say that um, the genus Lilium, the true lilies are a good example where um, not all of them have the same germination requirements. So it's all complicated, um, but fun. Um, Lilium formosanum, the big white uh, east, Easter lily like lily will germinate almost right away and if they're grown well, will bloom the following summer, where some of our native species and wild species from other part of the year, they have to be sown warm and then go through a winter. And after the first winter, the seed will germinate, but it won't produce any top growth. It'll just produce a, sh a root. And then it has to go through another summer, and another winter before it'll make a top growth. So, um, you know, these different plants vary in their germination requirements, um, and some are much simpler than others. Um, so, where to go from here? Um, and I brought these seven pots out. If you, you might remember from a midweek program many months ago, I mentioned that the uh, butterfly weeds, um, the Asclepias, some of them will germinate readily if you harvest them before they're fully, the seeds are fully mature. You know, if you harvest them before the fruit turns brown and splits open. Um, and we got out of these seven pots, maybe about five seeds germinated. And I'm hoping, and I think it's likely that the seeds that did not germinate um, will still be viable. So these will spend the winter outside and hopefully there'll be a lot of germination next spring. Um, now, you might be wondering if you, you have to leave these things outside, um, you know, because an alternative would be to put them in your refrigerator, provided other members of your household are willing to put up with that. Or maybe you have a spare refrigerator in the um, uh, basement. Um, and it's an, I need to emphasize the fact that if um, these seeds that need chilling, they need temperatures in the range of 40 degrees or so. Um, so if you were to sow a pot and put it in the freezer, um, it's not getting the kind of chilling that it needs because when they freeze, all the changes that need to be happening in the chemistry of the seed need to uh, come to a standstill when they're frozen solid. So it's not, you don't put these things in the freezer. Um, you put these things um, in the refrigerator if you're not putting them outside. Um, and the other thing is um, seeds need to be sown. They need to have taken up water. Um, in, in order to be affected by um, the, in order, in order for the chilling to be effective. If, if, if I took these dried seeds and put them in the refrigerator or the freezer, nothing, nothing, nothing's going to happen. If I sow them and they imbibe water, well, then, um, then, then those chemical changes will happen. Of course, that applies to the things that are where the seed the dormancy of the seed is controlled by ke uh, chemicals. The things with hard seed coats like the legumes, um, 
you know, they're, they're going to need the 40 degrees and probably some of those freezing temperatures to damage the seed coat because that, that's a physical change to the seed coat as, as opposed to the change in chemistry um, of the seed. So um, they need to be sown, they need to be at 40 degrees and not 50, de and at 40 degrees, not at freezing temperatures in order for um, those chemical changes to happen. Um, sowing them, you know, the general rule um, is, you know, you want to cover the seed, you know, maybe two or three times the width of the seed. So the bigger seeds get covered deeper. Some things I don't have a good example of it here today, but some things like, oh, digitalis seed or um, rhododendron seeds are as fine as dust. And those you would just um, sow on the surface of the soil and not cover them up. Um, buy a good quality um, soil, uh, soilless uh, potting mix, like you might buy for houseplants or stuff. Um, you know, you don't want to use dirt from the garden because it won't have good drainage. Um, it might be great soil in the garden, but not in the container. Um, you, you know, label them. Um, I, you know, I mention this every time we deal with potting something. Um, you can buy really good quality lab plastic labels uh, for a lot of money, or you can find a discarded pair of uh, Venetian blinds for free, or buy a cheap pair for not much money. And they make really good garden labels. And you could spend a lot of money on a fancy uh, waterproof marker that might last, but I wouldn't ever uh, go use anything fancier than a good lead pencil. And I don't usually um, name specific brands when I'm, um, you know, doing these programs. But it's really discouraging nowadays that you can buy a lead, a regular lead pencil, and it won't even write properly because I guess the lead is not enough graphite and too much clay or something. Ticonderoga is an American brand and these pencils actually still write like a pencil should write. And you can find them in any office supply store. So, and these labels are easy to write on. I certainly have had some bought labels that, um, you know, are so slick it's hard to write on. Um, the source of information, um, again, if you belong to one of those plant societies, like the American Rock Garden Society or the Hardy Plant Society, their seed list probably contains all the uh, germination requirements you need to know, whether they need to be warm first and then a cold period or, or whatever, or, or if they need to be, um, you know, given light when they germinate or that or light needs to be excluded when after they're sown um, you know online there's um, no end of sources um, one reference and i think it's still available in, in print is by norman dino d-e-n-o um, it's a very you know i don't know what word, word to use very no frills kind of um, book just with a list of plants and um, this is now many years old and this is the first supplement to the second edition of seed germination theory and practice. Um, I looked online, um, I think you can still buy copies of, um, of his um, references and all it is is, you know, um, detailing what requirements they need to uh, germinate. Um, and I discovered that if you misspell his last name and you look up dino rather than dino, you will find all sorts of references on growing dinosaur kale. Um, and, you know, books on um, plants themselves, like Michael Durr's book on woody, woody landscape plants, it's basically a reference ab about the plants themselves, but it has some propagation details as well. Uh, there was a, a Russell uh, contacted the Arboretum about the germination requirements for pawpaw, 
And I didn't know that off the top of my head, so I looked in Michael Durr's book, and pawpaw um, seeds likely have a dormant embryo and have a um, impervious uh, seed coat. So the recommendations were to uh, sow it warm, moist, um, and then keep it at 41 degrees um, for 60 days. And if, if the coat is, if the seed coat is impermeable, I'd be tempted to put a little nick in the seed coat. Um, pawpaw seeds are fairly big. They're not penny shaped, but oh, they're maybe about the size of a lima bean before you cook it. Uh, so they're pretty big seeds. Um, what else? Oh, I know, I, I tried to buy some um, granite grit, like, uh, is fed to chickens for uh, for their uh, crop for gr you know chickens don't have teeth so they grind up food in their in their gizzard inside and they keep gravel in there and it seems like um, I went to two different places that sell chicken supplies and both of them um, did not carry granite grit but I'm mentioning that because um, the granite after the seed is sown and covered with the potting soil, a, a practice that I think is really valuable is to cover the surface of the soil. I would, you know, a pot like this, I'd fill it up to the brim with granite grit. Um, and granite grit goes a long way to suppressing weeds. And some the, the two worst weeds we get in our seed pots are moss and liverwort. Not the cold cut liver worse, but liver warts, which are um, an odd looking um, moss relative. I should have brought a pot out with, with some of both of those in. Um, and also, if, if we, we leave these things outside with the thought that the rain itself might help leach uh, the chemicals in the seeds that are causing the seeds to remain in dormancy. Um, but if there's a hard rain, the granite grit on the surface of the soil goes a long ways to um, prevent the, um, so the soil and the seeds from, um, from splashing away. Another problem often encountered with sown seed pots are our little friends um, like mice, I guess mostly mice. They will dig through pots and eat the seeds. Um, those little mesh bags that um, onions and other produce come in, I often use those at home. I'll slip the pot or several pots into one of those and seal it. And um, they have often uh, prevented mice and squirrels from, and um, also birds from messing with the sown seeds. Um, I also use those same bags in the summertime on my tomatoes um, when they're when a fruit starts to ripen I'll put one of those on the fruit and it, they have really helped to keep the squirrels and birds from uh, you know eating the tomato fruit before it's fully ripe um, what else do I well I did bring a, another thing out um, we have some hardy citrus that make these great big fruit and things of things that are you know citrus are mostly subtropical most citrus aren't winter hardy in you know warm zone seven um and these are a uh, um oh good these are um a grapefruit crossed onto the trifoliate orange. The trifoliate orange is, um, up until recently, was in its own genus, Ponsiris, but the uh, taxonomists have decided it's closely enough related to the true citrus that we will now call it a true citrus. And a lot of um, woody plants with, um, um, the seeds, you know, a lot of woody pl plants from warmer climates, the seed needs to be germinated right away. And 
one of these seeds, you probably encountered citrus where you, you're eating a fruit and there's some citrus seeds that have already um, put out a root in the, um, in the fruit. Um, so, you know, th those might be worth sowing. The, whatever offspring they produced would probably be somewhere between the two parents. The, the trifoliate orange has a fruit about, about this size. They're a yellow orange when they ripen, but by this time of the year, most of them are rotting. But um, but you see, they're absolutely full of seeds. And I would, you know, if you wanted to start these from seed, I would sow them right away. Um, certainly the trifoliate orange seeds survive the winter because under our plant, um, there's often a carpet of seedlings. Indeed, there's some concern it might be an invasive exotic, um, you know, seeding around where it shouldn't. But um, I would sow these right away and I probably would keep them in the, you know, in a frost-free location. Um, asparagus is another one with the fleshy fruit. Um, and there's, there's a limited number of seeds per fruit. And asparagus, I don't know if it's typical of the whole genus, I might guess that it is. Um, the plants are either male or female, so of course only the female has seeds. And these are, you know, these ornamental asparagus are the same genus as the ones we eat as a vegetable. And, you know, their, their new shoots are quite slender, but some of them are also quite tasty. I don't know specifically about this one. This is one that uh, we find quite tasty. See, the seeds are pretty large. I would sow those and um, leave them out for the winter. Um, th this citrus being a hybrid between two very different parents, um, I mentioned, uh, you know, the offspring would not be true to th th this seed parent. Um, and most of the, well, this would be a good example too, this um, farfugium. Um, you now the wild type of farfugium would have a solid green. This is a garden cultivar, Oreo maculata, meaning yellow spotted for some reason. Um, it's probably likely that its seedlings would um, have green foliage and not this yellow spotted, but sometimes it's fun to start these things from seed. Um, sometimes just the opposite happens. Years ago, I started um, seeds collected from a variegated iris, and what I ended up with all, all albino seedlings without any chlorophyll at all. So as you would imagine, they didn't live for long. And I had that same experience starting um, seed collected from a variegated yucca. But, you know, maybe this, um, you know, all right, any one of these um, plants I collected could be a named cultivar. Like there's a new select, there's several named selections of Amsonia. This is Amsonia hubrichtii, but there's a new cultivar called butterscotch. And we could raise seedlings from seed uh, produced by butterscotch, but we wouldn't call the offspring butterscotch because they might look a lot like mom, just like when you go to the pound and they're saying this dog is a German Shepherd mix. Well, it looks like it might be, but it really might be something else. So um, things don't come true from seed. Um, so don't expect your, you know, whatever your, your um, oh, give me a name. Um, don't expect your Tropicana Rose uh, the seed from your Tropicana rose to produce um, offspring that look at all like mom. Um, but the flip side of that is the, the kind of genetic diversity you get out of uh, growing things from seeds makes for a much healthier population than having just one, um, you know, individual. 
And when you raise things from seeds, you often get some exciting uh, things that are different. Most often they're just, you know, similar to the parents. Yes, Chris. Doug, I just always like to add a little thing about some citrus, since you're especially talking about citrus and the topic of coming true from seed. Uh, citrus often have apomictic embryos in the seeds. So you will get a sexually produced embryo and a asexually produced embryo in the same seed. And one of those is exactly identical genetically to the parent plant. And you just don't know which one's which, but you'll okay. have two. Okay. I thought that's kind of cool. No, that's that's you really grow, cool. Um, um, grapefruit seedling or seed, and it's weird seeing two embryos coming out of one plant. One seed, that is, excuse oh, me. Oh, the, the two are produced from in, one, in one seed. seed. Yep, yep. Oh, that's really weird. Yeah, it is. Are we allowed to even talk about such things on, I, on air? I, hanky panky in the citrus mm. world, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Mm. I'll mute. Okay. Um, Oh, and, and, no, and I don't remember if I said, if you're buying seeds from a commercial source, the catalogs often have um, a lot of information on, um, you know, the germination requirements for the seeds that they are selling. Um, and if they don't, they probably do on their website. Um, I don't think I have anything else to add right now, but other than to encourage people to try this, um, you know, nothing tends to, you, you probably won't have much germination until late winter when things start to warm up, late winter, early spring. Um, you know, sow them now, leave them outside. Um, and, you know, be surprised this spring. Well, it's a good time to come to a conclusion because we just had a, a nice question from Eric. Okay. Uh, he has a muley grass and would love yeah. to know how to propagate that one the best. And I commented to him that my pink muley actually grew a seedling all on its very own. I, I didn't do it on purpose. It just did it itself. But have you ever grown that one from seed or is that one you think might be just better from division? No, I, I think um, I th I'd prefer to start it from seed um, on this Switchgrass, the seed are, are real obvious on the muley grass. It's a little less obvious, but as soon as possible, I'd go in and probably just do this sort of the same thing I'm doing now and just sort of raking off whatever comes off of the, um, you know, the flower head. And so those, um, the uh, common muley grass can be uh, decimated by a disease called tar spot. Um, if you look really close at the slender leaf blade, you'll see these tiny little black spots, which is why it's called tar spot. So if you raise young plants from seed, they'd be starting off in uh, life disease-free because diseases tend not to be transmitted um, uh, through seed. So on something like the muley grass, I think starting fresh plants from seed would give them fresh plants that'd be maybe a bit more vigorous than just dividing the same plant. That, even that the white is very form, good advice, Doug. Yeah, even though I've known the white flowered form to be started from seed. Um, and I meant to collect seed of the white fruited um, American Beauty Berry because I, I'll sow that this time of year. And a lot of plants when they're albinos, if they're only like if you have white fruited, the plant I collect seed from of the white fruited American Beauty Berry is growing all by itself, there aren't any other beauty berries around and it's loaded with fruit, but because it's not being pollinated by a purple a fruited one, all of its offspring will have white fruit. And a, a lot of plants that are albinos, uh, you know, like the white form of red bud or the white form of purple coneflower or the white fruited form of Nandina, as soon as they germinate, you know whether or not they're gonna have white flowers or fruit because they won't have any red or purple pigment in the foliage. Um, so e even I've, I've known the white fruit, the white flowered form of Muhlenbergia, the uh, purple muley grass to be started from seed. And if it's not been pollinated by the purple one, it'll be uh, all white flowered. We have a question from Val. She says, actually not really a question, but I'm gonna turn it into a question. I think it's a good one. Uh, Val says that she's had no luck getting pulsatilla to germinate. Do you have any advice for her that might help out? I know, I think we've grown them from we've seed. We've grown it many times from seed. 
I don't. I don't remember ever doing anything special to it. Um, Pulsatilla is a more of an alpine plant. I don't remember if it's germinated when it was first sown. We tend to sow se seeds um, as so almost as quick soon as we uh, have access to them, whether they're collected here or they're coming from another source. Um, so they might get sown in midsummer. And just yesterday I was going through all our seed pots, which were sown this year and deciding, um, you know, looking at the ones that where there hasn't been any germination and deciding, um, you know, whether it would be appropriate to now send them outside to spend the winter outside. And in general, if it's a, you know, a hardy herbaceous or woody perennial, they, if they haven't germinated yet, they go outside. So I'm sort of thinking pulsatilla might germinate after it's had a I've been out for the winter. Got another one over here. It's a, a private message. Someone is wondering about Meta Sequoia. You have any advice for that one? Um, all I know is um, there's a garden in Hillsboro, North Carolina, who got some of the very first seedlings of Meta Sequoia when they were introduced to the U.S. in the 1940s. Um, because the original owner of that place had been secretary of the Navy under Millard Fillmore. And so they had political co um, connections. And in the late 90s, when I was there, the seedlings were starting to come up fairly heavily in the garden. So I'd suspect you wouldn't have any trouble starting it from seed. But you know, these questions about the specific germination requirements of plants are better answered by you know, an online search or, or one of these references I referred to. I certainly don't know what each plant's germination requirements are. Okay, we have uh, another one here that's not quite a question, but I think it might generate some nice comments. Uh, Val says that she purchased Cosmos that was special, and by special she means double. But when it flowered, it was single and nothing like what was advertised. And she said she thought annuals were supposed to be like the mother plant. Any general comments on that one? I'm not sure what she means by the mother. Oh, oh. They're, they're, she you, means, they, they usually come true from seed yeah, where they're supposed to. Um, I think she needs to contact the company she bought the seeds from and get her money back. Yeah, I would think if they all came up that way, it could yeah. have been even a mispackaging of some yeah, kind. Or, there's, that's not yeah. right. That's not right. I mean, you might get one or two that might have come up wrong, yeah. but not, not the whole entire batch. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of, well, but th most things that are started from seed, they're not, they're not like a clone, but, um, you know, like the, the hellebores this, that are, the Lenten roses that are started from seed, that are seed strains, they, uh, uh, the majority of the offspring should be very much like what's advertised. You'll get this random ones, but you know, the majority of them should be as advertised. Yeah. Well, I don't know about Val, but I think the single Cosmos are awfully pretty, so I hope, I hope oh, you enjoy well, them, Val. Well, Val probably does too, but she was also <laughs> hoping for some, she didn't get her money's worth, yeah. Okay, I'm just looking for anything else over or, here. I'm assuming Val is, Val could be a guy too. Oh, it, that's Val Lorenz. Oh. Um, so the publication that you had over here, Doug, that one's available online now, just for your knowledge, in case you didn't know okay. that one. Um, oh, here's, here's a question from Shirley. She has some very light colored aster seeds and um, some nearly white Gallardia seeds. She's wondering if she should think that they might be immature. Okay, and she's, what, what she's referring colors? to the color yeah, of the, the seed. Yeah, the color of the seed. Kind of like you said that the, um, um, I forget which seed you were talking about that was so light colored. Um, oh, th that was the, the, um, the, the holly. The holly, yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't, it was Gallardi and what was the other thing? Aster. Yeah, Aster. Asters. Um, they're kind of tan. They're not really a yeah, really they're, dark they're, brown. They're not dark by any means. They're you know, I can barely see them. And all the fluffy them. stuff around them might give them a rather yeah. white appearance, too. You know, maybe, maybe she's looking at the Pappas, the little um, parachute. And, well, the, yeah, the, these are far from being dark. But ripe, ripe seed usually does turn a, a color 
maybe not a yeah. black or a dark brown well, in the seeds, but they that, often turn a color. That is so often the case, but yeah, then you have always. things like these rhodias that yeah. look like tapioca pearls. Yes, and those are very um, close to white, aren't they? Yeah, and then, uh, you know, so many, you know, I don't know the plant families as well as I used to because they've been so jostled about, <laughs> but um, this is rhodia and, you know, other somewhat close kin like Ruscus and um, I'm thinking Solomon seals seeds are white like that. They're, they're, they're almost translucent. Um, but in, in, in the majority of things, immature seeds are white and then as they ripen, they turn black or, or a darker color. Without knowing the aster and the gyardia, yeah. I would think the, a light tan would be a normal color yeah. for both of those. Yeah. So if you've ever grown a ficus from seed yourself, Doug, do you have any comments for Remco? Um, no, like, I've never grown a ficus from seed. Um, most ficus are tropical plants and they're born in fleshy fruit, so I would be inclined to sow the seed as quickly as possible. I'm, I'm kind of guessing maybe she was even thinking about the um, edible fig. Yeah, fig is uh, ficus, one of the few that's winter hardy here. <laughs> here. Here's a fun one from Cindy, and I'm laughing because quite often people think that these are kind of weedy plants. Any tips for getting impatience, uh, capensis, jewel weed to germinate? Um, well, you know, if I, impatience, capensis, is our local native and patient species. Yeah. It's a tall, four to five foot tall one, either with yellow or orange flowers. Um, it's not the showiest thing. It's uh, one of the few things, native plants blooming in shade in the woods in the summer if it's a moist location. And hummingbirds do make use of it. So there is value to it. My inclination would be to collect the um, seed when they're ripe and just broadcast them where I wanted them in the garden. They always seem to grow in a very moist area. Yes, and yes. Consistently moist, not, yes. not in a spot that dries out. So it could be right. moisture, Cindy, that um, you need to uh, have really good germination. And um, I, I saw a beautiful one in Europe, a different impatience. I forget which one it was that um, is an invasive weed out there in Europe. Uh, a lot of pinks and yeah. pink, dark pink. It was stunning. Yeah, it's, right? it's a big genus. Yep. And there are actually some, some that are winter hardy perennials here. Um, the garden's director, Mark Wethington, acquired two new species this, this fall that, um, you know, are being sheltered in a cool greenhouse this winter, but are likely to be uh, winter hardy and will plant out next spring. Sorry, I'm just doing a little bit of chat. Sure. Okay, just seeing if we have any more other questions. Um, question here, um, it's a direct message. What type of cone flower is white in color? I know the Echinacea purpurea comes in a white one. I don't yeah. know if I can think of another one that does, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, the, the cone flowers, the Echinaceas, um, it's a small genus, I don't know, maybe 10 species. And I suspect at some point, somebody has found white forms of all of them. The only one I've ever seen is the white form of the common purple mm -hmm. coneflower, Echinacea purpurea. Um, and if that's growing just with other white coneflowers will come true from seed. Um, there are named cultivars of it, like powwow white and- um, White uh, swan was very common. Yeah, white, that good, yeah white swan. Um, but if you, if you had a white flowered white form and it's it's blooming and not getting pollinated by purple ones, the offspring should be white. Okay. We have a question here from Betsy. Uh, you have any tips about the soil for seeds other than the top dressing of grit? The soil for sowing yeah, seeds? Yeah, what, like what, what do you use for an actual soil body media? Um, there used to be a brand that was my go-to brand. Um, the company was Fafford. F-A-F-A-R-D, yep. um, but that company was bought out by, I'm not going to think of, Castle 
Kessel something or another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I'll see if I can find that yeah. one. Yeah, and um, they now sell, I think it's the same product, it's this product, um, as Jolly Gardener. Now, we have access to it because, you know, here, the Arboretum is part of the Hort Field Lab, and there's, you know, many different researchers and stuff using this potting mix, so it's bought in by the tractor-trailer load in, in bags, but I guess it might show up in garden centers. Um, can I mention a few brand names? I don't see why not. Yeah, you know, miracle Grow potting soil is pretty good. I'd probably add a little bit more perlite to it, which is this crunchy white stuff, which is, uh, you know, volcanic glass obsidian that's um, popped at really high temperatures. It's really good for uh, improving drainage. Um, there's another brand that I really like, a uh, retail brand, Black Gold. Um, those are some really good ones. You know, for for sowing seeds and growing your favorite houseplants, I, I, I don't cut corners on um, the potting soil. You know, I, I think when we when we buy houseplants, they're, they're the lost leaders, you know, the pots and the saucers and the potting soil. That's where um, we spend a lot of money. But yeah, a good bagged potting mix without any actual dirt in it um, um, is, is, is what I would recommend for sowing seeds. And you know, I, I did recommend grit on the top of it. Don't substitute a sand because sands are so variable and, and a fine sand like play sand, you might as well just throw everything in the garbage if you're gonna put something like that on. There is a sand called filter bed sand, which is very pure and quite coarse. It's not quite as coarse as the granite grit, but it's very close to the granite grit. So I'm going to continue to look for the granite grit, but if I don't find it, I'll probably get a bag of filter bed sand. Well, do do ask me for the chat because there's several people I think put sources for some grits. I figured, I thought chat. that might happen. I thought that might happen. Maybe them are people who keep chickens. Oh, they very well could be. Yeah. Um, uh, I was I was just had a something on oh um the castle name we're trying to think of is Old Castle. Yes. Old yes, Castle. Yes. And I think they're actually based in North Carolina. Yeah. But I remember the uh, Fafard potting soil. That was always my favorite too. Yeah. For, for sowing seeds, I just I quite often just go for a potting media that doesn't have really big chunks in it. So that no, does no, or does no, not. Does not. Yeah. Fafford made a seed sowing mix yeah. and actually today when I was in one hardware store looking for granite grit and other things. Um, the black gold also has a seed sowing mix. It's just finer than, you know, what you'd pot a big robust, you know, philodendron in or something. Oh, here, here's a, a question from Val, and I think it's a great one. Um, um, goes on the topic of sowing seeds in a community pot or sowing them in the garden. She did a bunch of echinacea in the garden and none of them germinate, and she was wondering if the birds got her seeds, and that certainly is possible, or even just uh, some kind of um, seed-collecting insect could have gotten it. Um, you know, for, for some things, um, especially things that don't like to be transplanted, sowing directly in the garden is often the best way to sow seeds. Um, if it's something you have in limited quantity, something that's very choice, I think it's always safer to sow it in a pot um, and Val used the term community pot. That's when you sow a whole bunch of seeds in one pot or stick a whole bunch of cuttings in one pot. Um, for some things, and this is really more of a late summer thing than this time of year, some things like the hardy annuals, things like larkspur and the annual poppies that get, start in late summer and then bloom in early spring. Um, a lot of those things don't like to be transplanted, so we don't sow them in a community pot and then prick them out because they would die from that treatment. So we sow them in a cell pack, just like, you know, the tomato transplants you buy in the spring. And that way, you know, they, they get transplanted out of the cell pack, but their roots aren't being disturbed. And I really like that method because they need to be started like September, October. And at that time, the garden is still full of the summer plants. So there's no room to plant them. 
Um, and then by time frost and the gardeners have removed plants from the garden, it's quite late to sow them directly. Um, and so but when that space is cleared out, you can plant them exactly where you want them in the garden because the self-sown seeds, you know, if you've had larkspur one year, you'll tend to have it forever, but the best seedlings will come up in places like the stepping stone path or mm -hmm. the gravel in the driveway or something like that. So I like to start those things in uh, cell packs rather than community pots. So Linda commented over here in the chat that Fafard was bought out by a company with Sun in the name. And she said Sunset or something Sun related. And then we have another comment uh, private that was Sun Grow Potting Media. It's one that she likes. So there might okay. be something different. You know, um, always happy to hear other people's yeah. recommendations. And Linda said that her favorite was the three beef uh, version. Yeah, Fafford came with all sorts of designations yes. like three B, one B, whatever. So we have a just a simple question in here uh, from Ulana, and it was uh, something I talked about in the chat. Someone asked earlier that I answered, uh, "What can they be sowing? What can be sown now for flowering next year?" And I commented that um, now is probably the time for sowing winter annuals, things like the um, poppy seed poppy or nigella or anything else that's a, the winter annuals would be a great one. So we're getting kind of well, on the talent, I think, but still, still should work. My preference, I think the best time for starting those is September. Okay, Marie um, always does hers on Black Friday. She says she likes to avoid the shopping oh, frenzy and does hers on Black Friday. <laughs> yeah, and- but Yeah, um, you can do them early. She did some I'll, earlier this year too. JC, Dr. JC Rawson always bemoaned the fact uh, he was a, um, Iowa boy? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. And I, I guess in Oklahoma, you can grow sweet peas really well. The, the, the uh, peas that are grown for their fragrant cut flowers. Um, so he always bemoaned the fact that he couldn't grow them here, but old timers in this area said to sow them on Thanksgiving day, which would be very close to Black Friday. And uh, some people sow their fava beans, I think at that same time too. Not that many people grow fava beans. Um, you know, what might you sow now? Um, I don't know. Well, if, if you forget um, to do your well, poppy seeds on uh, Black Friday, <laughs> now's a whole lot better than tomorrow. Mm. Well, um, yeah, I and the, the, question, you, the question was what to sow now for spring bloom. Well, some, some Herbaceous perennials are real fast from seed. Mm -hmm. Some will take years before they bloom much, but other things, if they're started now, will bloom this summer. Yeah. Well, I think that takes care of the comments in the chat. Of course, Love you had them. a whole bunch of kudos and thank yous and folks saying how much they've enjoyed the midweek programs. And I hope you all will join us in January. We'll be back again with uh, a plant lovers tour the first week in January. So I hope you can see you then. And Doug, thank you so much for a My great year pleasure. of midweek program. We really appreciate it. And thanks to, of course, everyone for joining us every week here on, on online here at the J.C. Ralston Arbor. And we appreciate it. And we'll see you next year. Have a great one. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.